will be aware by now that 19 children and two adults were murdered in Uvalde in Texas in one of those school shooting massacres that happens in America. And the severity of them is a wrench on the hearts of everybody who encounters the information. Of course, all of us will be reaching for answers, words of condolence, political solutions, social solutions. And I feel that since we've been doing this channel, this is perhaps the most awful event that's happened, and it's been a really strange few years that we've all endured together, but there's something particularly galling about the murder of children. A story of that nature... Def yes. Yes. And this is why I've been trying to be extremely quiet about it, because honestly, I can't speak on it properly without getting too excited and um, and, and, and possibly to the point where I'm really not controlling my my emotions and I'm saying things that are off colored and, um, and that's not really a good look for me. So I'm just, let me check out Russell checking it out and I'm, and I'm gonna add my two pennies. Particularly galling about the murder of children. A story of that nature defies rational explanation. Of course, we will try yes. to rationally understand it. I don't think there's any rational way to deal with what's happened in Uvalde, Texas. I don't think that you can say it's one mentally ill person or it's a result of gun laws, although it probably is the result of one mentally ill person and tighter gun controls and restrictions of access to firearms would obviously make a difference to the number of murders in America using firearms. But why are people so attached to the idea of firearms? Is it simply that there's a powerful American gun lobby? And if there is a powerful American gun lobby, which there's no doubt that there are, what is the emotional connection that people have to firearms? All of these questions perhaps can be put aside for a moment. I once heard Michael Beckwith the uh, American pastor and evangelical speaker of the trans-denominational agape movement say on the occasion of Kobe Bryant's sad death, which he reported to his church. In this moment, he said, as he told his congregation and they gasped, we have a duty to put aside our own feelings and acknowledge that there are people directly affected by this. And if we hold them now in our minds and our hearts, they will feel it because in the final analysis, all things are non-local. We are connected to one another. I have no smart political take to make on an event as tragic as this one. I'm a father, I have children, I can't even allow myself to imagine for a moment the depth of searing grief I might feel if I was subject to a trauma such as this one. I have friends who went and worked at Sandy Hook to help the grieving parents after the last comparable massacre of this nature. What I feel about this and how this fits into the remit of what we try to talk about here on this channel in this community is that we are evidently living in a culture that is in decline. Yes, you could blame an individual. Yes, you can blame gun laws. Both of those things are true. But do you not think that this is symptomatic of a deeper malaise that can't be ascribed simply to cultural and racial tensions, but something more horrific than that? That we have lost our vision of what we are as a culture, that we have lost our way individually and collectively. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. And we're becoming numb to seeing certain things happen around this, this world. And um, it's a bunch of things we can contribute to that. We can say video games have something to do with that. Certain musics have something to do with that. Certain politics have something to do with that. Certain conversations, certain places, um, it's, stresses have something to do with that. Not being able to, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's so much negativity all over the internet. It's crazy. All over um, media is crazy. It's so much to attribute to it. I once heard someone say that on these video games now, you can see someone's pimple on their face. It looks more clear than I am right now. But it's teaching kids how to kill someone that looks super, 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 super natural and them not even feel a way about it because to them is a game. So now it becomes easier for someone to shoot their mom and then get in the car and go shoot someone else to shoot their grandma and then get in the car and go shoot someone else because they've already shot the person closest to them. And once they get past that level, then it becomes, okay, um, hmm, <sighs> can't say I don't feel too bad from this. And this was the person that meant the most to me.
in all the world. So, all right, Russell Brand. See, he makes a lot more sense to me. Me, I get a, he's, he's all over the place when it comes to, um, like he touches on every single position to look at it. Like however you're sitting at it, whatever your vantage point, your periphery, your scope is, he touches on all of those things. Me, I'm usually coming from my own heart before I get to that. And I'm not, you know, I'm just now learning it all. ...of what we are as a culture, that we have lost our way individually and collectively, collectively. that we have yeah. lost our connection to nature, inner and outer, to God and to one another, that we are living in systems that prevent us from becoming who we truly are. If you have a nihilistic, empty, banal culture focused on rationalism and materialism, that you're just here for a short while, you live and you die, where is the room for the sacred? What do your communities mean to you? What do you mean to yourself? This guy that did this horrific, unimaginable act to these poor, innocent children, what kind of existence did he have? What kind of trauma had he experienced? I'm certainly not seeking to justify the actions of a person that has caused so much grief. And actually, of course, I don't need to justify it because I am merely a commentator. I'm seeking to understand how a culture can generate such trauma and misery with such alarming regularity. And if something occurs consistently and you can observe it consistently occurring, the condemnation of the individual, while an understandable part of the process, is not going to lead to a solution. I would not be so glib as to offer a practical solution, but if you live in a world where open debate and communication and transparency are lost, marginalised and maligned, people that are mentally ill and suffering and considering transgressive, egregious acts such as this one, acts of unimaginable horror, have nowhere to go but the most extreme places. If we have a culture where open communication is the norm, it will be less likely, perhaps considerably less likely, that people get all the way to action on something as extreme and malignant as this. That was good, bro. Very well broken down. I, I can't even add to that. I just need to stop just to say that. That was... Yeah. Neither, might I add, is postulating on the nature of regulations around firearms, although, of course, less firearms, less murder from firearms seems like a pretty simple piece of arithmetic. I would invite you to contemplate the question, why is there so much fear? Why is there so much anxiety? Why is there so much suffering? This happened in an impoverished community, a community of 16,000 people, many of whom are living in conditions of poverty. I think we have to look at the way we organise society. I think that when you have centralised elite institutions that issue doctrine and dictates without necessarily being affected by the results of the decisions they make, it creates a kind of maddening, desperate society. This is symptomatic of a deeper malaise, horrific though it is. For me, it thematically fits in with the general breakdown of our society, with the ongoing conflict and conflagration. I don't think we should be looking to blame any individual or group for this horrific event. I think we should turn our attention to healing. On both sides of the cultural argument at the moment, people are full of sturm and drang and fury and condemnation. Me, he's talking to me. And honestly, I'm... This right here is growth. It's called growth. Um, Russell Brand is to a point in his life where he's he's seen a lot. He's been through a lot. And he he knows what helped helped him get through it and get over it. So what he's sharing with people is the uh, is a healing process. And for that, I'm appreciative because um, I am one of the people who I'm I'm pissed off and I I do want to uh, condemn the 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 offender. Um, I I want to condemn the hell out of him. Um, and I, I, I do have like a whole bunch of frustrating feelings about, about it all that I want to, you know, yell and just, um, I don't know. I don't want to be indignant about it, but I do want to be truthfully who I am. And I believe that I'm not as mature as this gentleman is right now. Um, I might be, I might be, don't know, but that's what I'm learning right now. But I'm appreciative of be, um, being able to receive his perspective. These people are to blame. These people are to blame. We're all participating in this society. One way or another, we've made our way here together. When considering the death of a child and what it must feel like to go through that, I know there'll be people watching this now that have lost a child, perhaps not in such dramatic circumstances, 
but with the same result, that you have to live life now having lost a child. I know that there are people watching because we interact with you on this channel and we read the comments and we know that you are enduring all sorts of horror. When you lose a child as an individual, it's understood that you have to go deep within yourself and find a way around that grief and agony. When we lose children as a culture, this is a time for reflection and circumspection. This is not a time for certainty. This is not a time for, we need to do this, we need to do that, these people need to shut down. It's certainly not a time for political point scoring. It's a time for huge review. My invitation uh, to myself, to you, to all of us is, how can we now, right now today, be more compassionate and loving to every single person we meet? I'm not naive, I'm not foolish. I know there's such a thing as people that have bad motives. I've been alive in the world for a while now. But what I also recognise is that it's incumbent upon us as individuals to awaken our higher nature, to treat people with kindness for so many reasons. We don't know what they've been through and we don't know what we're going to go through and we don't know how this ends. All of us are... That was pretty dang on good. He said, I'm not naive. I had, he had to touch on that real quick. Look, look, I, I know I'm saying I'm not singing Kumbaya blindly. I'm not saying blindly singing Kumbaya. There's going to always be some bad mofos in the bunch, period. No matter how much love you show them. No matter, no matter how much light you bring to their darkness, it's still going to be them. But you can only do what you can do. Try. Try. I like that. And we don't know what we're going to go through and we don't know how this ends. All of us are sharing this planet for a finite time. All of us have a duty to awaken to who we truly are. All of us have a duty to create communities that are a reflection of our higher values. If we live in a society that is built essentially on fear and greed and suspicion and doubt, and I'm not talking about the poorest people in society, I'm talking about the most powerful people in society. How is your nation governed? What are the economic principles that determine the life of the majority of people? Where is the compassion? Where is the goodwill? Where is the good natured, good faith approach to one another? Of course, whenever you talk about significantly altering society, people point to its impossibility. This is the best of all possible versions. This is the best system we could come up with. But we've seen in the pandemic that you can radically alter society overnight when there is a germ threat or when there is a terror threat. Well, I say now we live under constant threat. We live under a psychic threat, a kind of horror, a bio horror of existence, where a significant number of people are living lives of absolute desperation. And the consequence of that is once in a while, someone emerges and does something so ugly, so unimaginable, so cruel and so ghastly that we're forced as a culture to look at the event and to look at ourselves. I would reiterate the advice of the great pastor and teacher Michael Beckwith and say, this is an opportunity for reflection for all of us. This is a time for us to look at those directly affected and to consider those that will be affected again in the future if the world doesn't change. For me, the gun law aspect of this and the firearm stuff of this, I'm sure there are many, many opinions on that. But I think we have a deeper conversation. Why do people want guns? Why are people so afraid? Why are people so desperate? Why have we created a culture with so much inequality and so much suffering and so much desperation where the sacred has been neglected to the degree where consistently, relatively regularly, there emerges a loner, an individual, but they're not loners and individuals anymore, are they? Because over time, it, it's a group, it's a phenomenon. It's a now, he covers everything, bro. And um, and honestly, that's, it's, that's not... It's, it's, it's helping me to think more, but it's not helping me to fine tune my thinking. It's not. It's helping me to find many other things to think about. It's helping me to find many other things to consider, but it's not fine tuning it. It's not, it's not slowing down my, my brain it's so that I can relax. It's giving me more things to talk about and consider and consider and to talk about. Like there's it's, it's so many people who's talking about gun laws. There's so many people who are already condemning the, the, the guy and there's so many people who are pissed off and so many people who are sad so many people who are afraid so it's it, all these things are already happening they're already happening I, and honestly i don't think that there's a time for us i don't I, honestly i think we definitely do need to show some love we do do need to show some um some caring and some more heart to people just so they can know that they don't have to go that far just to just to be heard 
no matter what they've gone through, they don't have to go that far. They don't have to do anything that daggone um, heinous. But, at, uh, you know, when when it comes to anybody's life, when they stop caring about themselves, everyone else is just a casualty of war. And that's the unfortunate part. Can we catch them before then? But if we can't catch them before then, we just definitely need to have some diligence, some 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 type of way of um, being able to track the algorithms of people who would do these sort of things. And I, and I said that exactly the way I, will, I wanted you to hear it. Because tracking algorithms is pinpointing things that we want, that we're interested in, that we want to see, hear, eat, wear, all of those things. As soon as we look on our phone, we see a bunch of things that's um, that's that's um, direct directed at us based off of our searches and where we go and how we move and what we say within earshot of whatever recording device we have near us. I'm just saying it's a way to be able to get in front of this before it happens. And I firmly believe that. I think I've, I've, I'm, I'm sure that people are having big meetings about this right now. I just want to hear exactly what's, what they're going to do to make that happen because, oh my God, this this two months in a row, guys. Two, was it even? No, it was in the same month. It's in the same month. Two mass shootings a thing that keeps happening, that are an expression of a deeper pain. There is more to reality than what we can see, hear and measure. We know that in this moment, don't we? Because we are experiencing a deep collective pain. Nothing compared to the people that are directly affected, but a cultural pain nonetheless. What is that pain and what lesson is that pain trying to bring us? Awaken change address this address this collaboratively collectively let's look at our individual lives our collective lives our communities our economic structures our international relationships our priorities the way we treat each other when we buy a cup of coffee the way we talk to our children the way we talk to people we disagree with our social media climate everything has to be reviewed and you can only do that if you start with yourself i am fortunate that i've lived a life where i've made many many mistakes and i've been given many second chances and where I sit now is a place of humility and uncertainty and doubt. The only things I feel sure of is on a daily basis, it's my duty to look at how I can improve myself, to look at how I can be of service to others, and to look at how I can be a contributor to the common good. I think we can change our individual lives. I believe we can change our collective lives. And I think we should do this in a spirit of gentle complicity not certainty and rage, not looking to amplify this cause or amplify that cause or condemn this group of people or hate on that group of people because this, above all else, is a horrific, sad, traumatic event. And as a result of it, right now, there are people in unimaginable pain. Perhaps before this happens again, because it will happen again, we can review the way we organise our society. We can review the way we organise our community. If your personal certainty is this is about gun regulation, then perhaps you can consider how you would create a society where people weren't so suspicious of authority that clinging to a gun was the best thing they felt they could do for their personal freedom. If you think that you should keep hold of your firearms, then perhaps you can be open to new ways that this could be regulated so events like this don't happen again. There is no point right now in doubling down on what you already believe. This is something that has to be approached with an open mind and an open heart and where we must individually question what can we do to make the world better? Because you know the truth, there's nothing we can do right now for those parents, nothing. So we have to look at the context in which these events occurred and recognize that these things are no longer anomalies. This conflagration, this continually stoked pain, the way we talk to one another, the way we type out messages, the way that we hate on one another. All this is completely true. All this is completely true. And I think this is amazing to, to heal people's hearts and to speak to the minds of people who want to be, who want to just figure out a way to kumbaya for a little bit. I don't think it's going to help anything though. I'm, I'm being a buck with you. I don't think it's going to help you. But I do want to hear from y'all in the comments below, man. And if you have yet to hit that subscribe button, please make sure you do so on your way out the door. This whole thing just pisses me off, bro. It pisses me. It pisses me off. Oh, my God. Once again, guys, I'm Van. And now we are all the LFR family. And I look forward to seeing you on the next video. And hopefully inside the Patreon as well. 
Y'all been amazing. Love y'all, man.